Section 1 Introduction We're going to delve into the world of artificial intelligence, AI, and its complexities. AI has made significant strides, resulting in highly sophisticated systems that make decisions for reasons we often can't comprehend. This lack of understanding has raised concerns about the widespread use of AI systems in our economy and daily lives as they introduce new risks, including the potential for AI to deceive humans to achieve undesirable goals. To address these concerns, we're exploring a concept called mechanistic interpretability. This involves understanding how neural networks, the brain of AI systems, calculate their outputs. By doing so, we can reverse engineer parts of their internal processes and make specific changes to them. To reverse engineer a neural network, we need to break it down into smaller units, or features, that can be analyzed individually. While using individual neurons as these units has had some success, it presents a challenge because neurons often activate for several unrelated types of features. Furthermore, for certain types of network activations, there's no reason to expect features to align with the neuron basis. We hypothesize that this complexity might arise because models learn more distinct features than there are dimensions in the layer a phenomenon we call superposition. This means the network forms a basis of non-orthogonal features that are more than the dimensions, which can only happen if the features are sufficiently sparsely activating. If they aren't, interference between non-orthogonal features prevents any performance gain from superposition. We believe we can recover the network's features by finding a set of directions in activation space. Each activation vector can then be reconstructed from a sparse linear combination of these directions, a problem known as sparse dictionary learning. We train sparse autoencoders to learn these sets of directions, a method similar to applying sparse dictionary learning to all residual stream layers in a language model simultaneously. We then use several techniques to verify that our learned features represent a meaningful breakdown of the activation space. We show that our features are more interpretable than neurons and other matrix decomposition techniques. We also demonstrate that our features enable less disruptive model editing and allow us to pinpoint the features used for a specific task more precisely than other methods. Finally, we run case studies on a few features, showing that they are not only monosemantic but also have predictable effects on the model outputs, and can be used for fine-grained circuit detection. To extract network features from superposition, we use techniques from sparse dictionary learning. We assume that each of a given set of vectors is composed of a sparse linear combination of unknown vectors. In our case, the data vectors are internal activations of a language model, and the unknown vectors are the network features we want to discover. We aim to learn a dictionary of vectors, called dictionary features, where for any network feature, there exists a dictionary feature that approximates it. To learn the dictionary, we train an autoencoder with a sparsity penalty term on its hidden activations. The autoencoder is a neural network with a single hidden layer, and we use the ReLU activation function in the hidden layer. We also use tied weights for our neural network, meaning the weight matrices of the encoder and decoder are transposes of each other. Our network produces an output for an input vector, which is meant to be a reconstruction of the original vector. The hidden layer consists of the coefficients we use in our reconstruction. Our autoencoder is trained to minimize the loss function, which includes a reconstruction loss and a sparsity loss. The sparsity loss encourages our reconstruction to be a sparse linear combination of the dictionary features. It has been shown both empirically and theoretically that reconstruction with a sparsity penalty can recover the ground truth features that generated the data. For more details on our training process, please refer to the appendix. Section Summary Advances in AI have led to the deployment of highly capable AI systems that make decisions without explainable reasoning, raising concerns about their trustworthiness. To address this, the authors propose a method called sparse dictionary learning to reverse engineer neural networks and understand their internal processes. By training sparse autoencoders, they aim to recover semantically meaningful features that can be used for model editing, feature pinpointing, and fine grained circuit detection. Section three interpreting dictionary features. We've developed a set of dictionary features and we're interested in understanding whether these features are less polysemous, and hence, easier to interpret. To do this, we need a way to measure the interpretability of a dictionary feature. We use an automated method that works well for assessing the interpretability of the thousands of dictionary features that our autoencoders learn. 
In simple terms, this method involves taking samples of text where the dictionary feature is active, asking a language model to provide a human-friendly interpretation of the feature, and then using this interpretation to predict the feature's activation on other text samples. The degree of correlation between the model's predicted activations and the actual activations gives us the interpretability score of the feature. We've compared our dictionary features with other methods for finding features in language models, such as the default basis, random directions, principal component analysis, PCA, and independent component analysis, ICA. Our dictionary features proved to be more interpretable than those found by these other techniques. However, we noticed that this advantage decreases as we move deeper into the model, suggesting that sparse autoencoders may not work as well in later layers. We also found that current language models have limitations in the types of patterns they can identify. For instance, they sometimes struggle to find patterns that revolve around the next or previous tokens rather than the current one. To show that our dictionary features correspond to functional units in the network, we used a process called concept erasure, which involves removing a specified feature from a learned representation. We evaluated our approach using a task that involves predicting gender based on a given name. We found that our method outperforms others in terms of hiding a concept from arbitrary linear probes, while causing minimal disruption to the model's behavior. In this task, we used a method called full rank ablations to prevent the model activations from activating in a certain direction. We selected dictionary features for ablation based on their ability to hide gender information from a linear probe. We then evaluated the top four dictionary features on their performance at the gender by name task. We compared our approach to two benchmarks, lease and difference in means projections. The latter involves finding the difference between the centroids of each gender class and projecting each activation onto the subspace orthogonal to that direction. We applied erasure interventions to each layer individually. We found single features in early layers of the model that, when ablated, outperformed lease and difference in means projections in model prediction accuracy removal while causing less disruption to the model's overall behavior. Section Summary The authors aim to measure the interpretability of their learned dictionary features by using an automated approach that prompts a language model to generate human-readable interpretations of the features. They compare the interpretability scores of their dictionary features to those produced by alternative methods and find that their features are more interpretable. Additionally, they demonstrate that their dictionary features correspond to functional units in the network by outperforming other methods in concept erasure tasks. Section 4.2 Transfer to Pronoun Prediction In this section, we're going to explore how our learned features can be applied to different tasks. We'll start by testing their ability to predict pronouns based on given names. For example, we might prompt the model to complete a sentence like, name, went to the store, where, pronoun, bought an object. We found that the features that were most effective in predicting gender also performed well in this pronoun prediction task. However, other methods, such as difference in means projection and lease, were not as successful. Next, we'll look at how we can identify dictionary features that are crucial for the task of indirect object identification, IOI. We used automated circuit discovery methods for this, which allowed us to pinpoint the dictionary features that directly influence the model's behavior during the IOI task. Because our dictionary features are more specific in meaning compared to those identified by other techniques like PCA, we were able to more accurately determine the features that are responsible for the model's behavior. We then adapted a method called activation patching to identify the dictionary features that are responsible for certain behaviors. We started with some corrupted data and identified the minimum number of changes needed to reproduce the model's behavior when run on the uncorrupted data. We used a variant of automated circuit discovery, where we removed dictionary features one by one until removing any more would significantly decrease performance. We measured the success of this method by comparing the model's behavior with and without the changes, and adjusted the threshold for performance decrease to balance precision and behavior reconstruction. We then intervened on activations using a formula that essentially adds the difference between the activations of our autoencoders on the corrupted and uncorrupted data points to the transformer's embedding of the corrupted data point. We performed these interventions on the residual stream at layer 12 of Pythia 410M and compared the results with a similar intervention using PCA. 
we found that dictionaries with a larger sparsity coefficient were able to represent the relevant information for the IOI task with fewer dictionary features, but at the cost of lower overall accuracy. This lower accuracy resulted in a larger corrupted residual, which we were able to limit to a very small number of directions without disrupting the model's behavior. In the next section, we'll look at individual dictionary features, focusing on those that correspond to a single, understandable explanation. We'll analyze our dictionary features in three ways, by identifying which tokens activate the feature and in what contexts, by determining how removing the feature changes the model's output, and by identifying the dictionary features in previous layers that cause the analyzed feature to activate. We found that our dictionary features are highly specific in meaning. We analyzed our dictionary directions by checking what text causes them to activate. Ideally, a dictionary feature will only activate on text corresponding to a single real-world feature. To illustrate this, we plotted a histogram of activations across token activations. We found dictionary features that only activate on specific tokens, such as apostrophes, periods, the word, the, and newline characters. However, not all instances of these tokens activate the feature. For example, the feature that activates for apostrophes does not activate for all apostrophes. We found other features that activate for apostrophes, but in different contexts. Section Summary In this section, the authors test the generalizability of their learned features for erasure by using them for pronoun prediction. They find that the features that perform well in gender prediction also allow for good erasure in pronoun prediction, while other methods fail. Additionally, the authors use automated circuit discovery methods to identify dictionary features that are causally relevant for the indirect object identification IOI, task. By using more monosemantic dictionary features, they are able to better localize the features responsible for model behavior on the IOI task. They also investigate individual dictionary features and find that some are highly monosemantic, activating only on specific tokens such as apostrophes, periods, and the token, the. Section. 6.2 Output. Dictionary features have intuitive effects on the logits. We've been examining how specific elements, which we call dictionary features, influence the predictions our model makes for the next token. To do this, we've been removing these features from the residual stream, a process we refer to as ablation, specifically using a method called less than rank 1 ablation. If the dictionary feature is meaningful, taking it out of the residual stream should logically impact the predictions for the next token. For instance, when we removed the feature that identifies apostrophes, we noticed a significant decrease in the prediction for the following s. This is exactly what we'd expect from a feature that recognizes apostrophes and helps the model predict an s that would typically follow an apostrophe in possessive forms and contractions like let's. We've also been exploring how these dictionary features relate to each other, both upstream and downstream. In other words, we've been looking at which features in previous layers trigger a given feature and which features in later layers are triggered by it. To identify these related features, we select a target feature, such as the one in layer 5 that predicts a closing parenthesis. We then find the maximum activation of this feature across our dataset and select 20 contexts that activate the target feature within a range of half to the full maximum activation. For each feature in the previous layer, we run the model again, this time without this feature and rank the features from the previous layer based on how much their removal decreased the target feature. If we want, we can then repeat this process with the features from the previous layer that had a significant impact. The outcome of this process is a causal tree, as shown in the figure. As the final layer, Layer 5's job is to provide instructions that directly correspond to tokens in the unembedding matrix. For example, when we unembed feature 5 underscore 2027, the top tokens are all variations of closing parentheses. This suggests that the previous layers are identifying all the situations that lead up to a closing parenthesis, such as dates, acronyms, and phrases. 